Greetings to all of you. Uh, I hope you are ready for the Word of God. Um, it's that time of Sunday again to, to us um, to focus on what the Lord has to say to us through Scripture. A week before last, I spoke from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, on a prophecy that Isaiah gave, and uh, we focus on the first name. And today, uh, I want us to go back there again, and we are going to look at the second name that Isaiah gives on that prophecy. But before we do that, let's just say a quick prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to be, to be present as we listen to his word, listen to God's word. Lord, we thank you that um, we can be here today. And Lord, I pray that as we draw closer to your presence, Lord, as we open scripture, I pray that your presence, your spirit, will be with us. It will fill us afresh, O oh God. I pray that your Spirit will illuminate Scripture to us. Lord, give us ears, give us eyes, and heart to receive. Lord, we need your Word. And Lord, I pray that as this preaching is being shared, Lord, I ask that you will give us, O oh Lord, ears to hear, and give us the ability to draw encouragement and strength for our life as we live for our time as we pass in through this third pandemic lord may your word as it says in scripture be a lamp unto our feet lord may scripture be a light into the darkness that is all around us i bless your word today lord in jesus name i pray amen 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 hallelujah so as I said, um, again, we're going to Isaiah chapter 9 and from verse 6 there. Um, and I do want to emphasize that this was a prophecy that Isaiah gave many, many, many years before uh, Jesus was born. And it is a prophecy because at the time that Isaiah gave this prophecy it was a very crucial time. If you look at chapter 8 of the book of Isaiah, verse 22 and onwards, around that area there, you will understand that the people of Israel, they were living through some great distress and a great darkness. And yet, the prophet is trying to, to bring a hope, to, to bring them to this understanding of a bright and beautiful future that God wants to present to them. He wants to show the Israelite how God is going to do something amazing. How he's going to redeem Israel and set the world right, if you like. But when you look at the heart of this message, um, it's simply the arrival of a baby. Literally, um, in, in, the, in the passage, the beginning of verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born. And then he says, To us a son is given. An unexpected claim, an unexpected um, announcement from a prophet, if you like, in the time that they were going through some great distress and darkness. And this is what the prophet gives them. This is the, the hope that prophet wants to give them. This is how he presents it. And I guess we can sort of um, look in our own circumstances. We've just entered... Um, the third lockdown here in England, pretty much uh, the UK. And if we look up to the Lord, what would the message be that the Lord would want to give us? I think it would be similar. It would be that he wants us to focus to what Isaiah is saying. He wants us to focus on Jesus. Because in Jesus we can find the answers that we need. In Jesus we can find the strength that we need to move from this darkness. To move from these difficult times. And not lose hope. Hallelujah. So this is what Isaiah again wants to give them. An encouragement. But the question comes, what's so special about this child? Who will this child be? What will this child do? And Isaiah um, doesn't really give a great description on that prophecy either. He just gives a few names. To be exact, four names 
We looked at one last week, wonderful counselor, and now that we are focusing, it's a mighty God. Hallelujah. This child that will be born is a mighty God. We as Christians, now we can confess that to be Jesus. Jesus shall be called, or he's called a mighty God. It's a pretty bold, pretty bold name, isn't it? I mean, you can imagine um, you being invited to a birthday party and a card comes to you and you open that card and you look into the uh, invitation and here it goes, you know, a baby is born 25th of December. This is how tall and this is how heavy and this is how big the baby is born and so on. And, and, and the name is not Jeff or Bob or Gavin or anything like that. Um, it's, it's a mighty God. Pretty bold name. You kind of probably be taken by surprise. What a name is that? In especially in our culture, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily hear such names. But exactly, friends, I think this is what we need to try to understand. Try to understand that that is what Isaiah wants to bring to our attention. That what God is about to do is nothing ordinary. Is nothing normal. It's extraordinary. Exactly that. Um, but also, what I want us to understand before we continue on. Do you think that Isaiah was trying to say by naming this child Mighty God that this child will be the Mighty God? I don't think so. I don't think that's exactly what Isaiah meant by it. You see, often in the Old Testament, people were given names, special names with great meanings, which described what God would do through that child. And you have a number of examples, if you like. I mean, if you look in the name of Hezekiah, we know uh, as a character in the Bible, Hezekiah. The meaning of that name, it means the Lord is my strength. You can look at the name of the prophet himself, Isaiah. What does that name mean? It means the Lord has brought salvation. And friends, what are we looking right now? We are looking at a prophecy that Isaiah simply was obedient to God's presence, was obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and he simply professed what he believed uh, God was saying to him. And that is the message of salvation, a plan of how God is going to bring salvation to not only the Israelites, but the whole world wide. That name that says God will do or who God is. This is what Isaiah is trying to bring to our attention through this prophecy. And so here, the child's name then, we might say, is a kind of job description for this baby. Because this is what it was meant in those days. This child will reveal the mighty God to Israel in a very unique way. Hallelujah. In a way that has never happened before. And friends, you need to understand that in the Old Testament, there have been some mighty works that have taken place through God. I mean, you can look at Moses. What God did through Moses is tremendous. God Part of the seas, you know, and you know the uh, cloud of fire leading by night and all of the acts that he performed um, to release his people. And yet here what Isaiah is trying to bring to the attention of people is that the way that God's going to reveal himself, the mighty God that he is will be in such a unique way that he has never done it before. Now, as Christians, we can confess that in the light of the progressive theology, progressive revelation of Scripture that we now know, that child is the same about Jesus Christ. That prophecy is all about Jesus Christ. 
It's Jesus who reveals to the world the mighty God of the Bible, which is in a very unique way. Do you remember what Jesus said to Philip in John chapter 14, verse 9? He said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus reveals the Father in such a unique way because the Father is at work in the life of Jesus in that very unique way itself. But yet, the Bible wants to say something more, friends. It wants to say something more to us. As we see the mighty power of God at work in this Jesus, we realize that this Jesus himself is the mighty God. It is the God who came and took the form of flesh, even as a baby, as a child. Hallelujah. And as we take this Isaiah's name, if you like, oh, this child will be, will be our starting point and um, we will develop more on the meaning of the mighty God. I want us to look into the life of Jesus, look from his conception, from the time of his conception, all, the, all um, to the resurrection. To see how the mighty power of God is at work in this mighty God we know by the name of Jesus. And the goal really is simple of this uh, preaching. That it would encourage us. It will encourage us to look and to rely on Jesus as the mighty God. And to do, as Paul says, far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. Hallelujah. As we look at the very birth or the conception of Jesus, we see how it's overshadowed by the divine power itself. Right at the start, we know how Jesus... Um, the conception was formed through uh, a virgin uh, Mary. And that itself, it is um, impossible for us to understand. That in itself is something that has never happened before and never will ever happen again. It is something that um, everyone will understand. We do not need to specialize in anything to understand what has happened. It's simply a miracle. It's a supernatural act of God, which is impossible for us, but very possible for him. So right at the start, we see the power of God overshadowing, the divine power of God overshadowing this baby, right at the conception, if you like. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 refers to this stunning miracle, if you like. And um, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born and called the Son of God. Right at the start, at the conception of Christ, in Mary's womb, God did something, friends, that he had never done before. And he will never do it again. It is by the power of the Spirit, God brought together two radically different realities in a single unity. He wedded the humanity and the divinity in the womb of Mary, in the person of Jesus. God closed, if you like, an infinite gap to bring together his own divine nature with our human nature in one person. It's an amazing display of power right there from the womb of the Virgin Mary. There is actually a writer which puts this really nicely, uh, Stephen uh, Sharnock. He describes this miracle in this way. He says, 
what a wonder what a wonder it is that two nature infinitely distant should be more intimately united than anything in the world and yet without any confusion that the same person should have both a glory and grief an infinite joy in deity and an in in expressible sorrow in humanity that a god upon a throne should be an infant in a cradle the thundering creator be a weeping babe and a suffering man are such expressions of mighty power as well as coincidence and love that they astonish man upon earth and angels in heaven Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a mighty power of God we can see um, in Jesus' birth. And one thing that is exciting is that it didn't stop there. This continues throughout the life of Jesus. Throughout the life of Jesus, we see the manifestation of of the power of the mighty God. In fact, we can look in chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke um, when Jesus started his ministry. He says that um, the power, in verse 14, the power of the Spirit was upon him and he began to proclaim the Gospel. This was uh, all about himself. And in the synagogue, um, in the Sabbath, he took the scroll of Isaiah and he opened to chapter 4 from verse 18 and onwards. And you know um, what the passage says due to the time. I will not go into read it, but he speaks about how God has anointed him to preach the good news, to proclaim the gospel to the poor and to set free the prisoners and bring healing to the broken heart and so on and so, and so forth. Um, and it was his life and ministry that were unlike anything else that, had, that anyone had ever seen. Um, and they came to such demonstration and power. Again, continue, Luke continues um, to tell us and tell everyone who saw Jesus while he was casting out demons and performing miracles. He says in verse 6, uh, 36 that they were amazed and said to each other what words are these with authority and power he gives order to impure spirits and they come out and that's because Jesus was teaching with such clarity demonstration of power everyone was following him on one occasion you know the story of, of, um, of a woman who was uh, suffering with bleeding for 12 years and when she and that is found in Mark 5 25 um, and on one occasion she managed to come close to Jesus and touch Jesus she touched him but she was full of faith and that moment scripture says that power went out of Jesus to her and touched her and Jesus stops and says who touched me that woman was healed just because she touched the clothes of Jesus. And we see this happening, friends, every time when Jesus went to our fallen world, if you like. He was constantly met with opposition, whether in the form of sickness, spiritual ignorance, demonic possession or even death itself. Yet, as the Gospels reveal to us, we see the power of the mighty God constantly at work in and through Him, pushing back the forces um, that were at work in the fallen world indeed. And we can, of course, easily say that um, the power of God is easily seen in the life of Jesus and especially in his miracles and his healings. But what about his death? What about his execution at the hands of the Romans? 
You see, many of us might say that the true power was um, shown by Pontius Pilate. That's where the real power, when he sentenced Jesus to death, not Jesus, who was led as a lamb to slaughter with his hands and feet nailed into that crucifixion, into that cross, if you like. Well, consider what scripture says about what the mighty God did, the power of the mighty God through the cross of Christ. I want to read to you um, from Col uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. This is what God calls true power. When you were dead in your sins and uh, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to that cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Hallelujah. Two important things there. God forgave us all our trespasses. An infinite weight of sin he bore at that cross. A weight that none of us could even imagine or can bear. Indeed, there is no one in this world that can do such thing except Christ. Christ himself. So he too, forgiving our sins, he made us, scripture says, he made us alive. He took those of us who were dead in their trespasses and sins and made us alive together with Christ. That's our hope. That's where the true power lays in Christ. An amazing display of resurrection power in our own souls. But the second thing, that's not the all, according to that passage. That's not all what happened. More than that, he disarmed all the spiritual forces that are arrayed against us, friends. So that while they were still aimed and shoot their guns, if you like, um, at us, now they simply are firing only blanks. And Paul says in Romans 8, chapter 1, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. All of these powers have been stripped away through the power of the cross of Christ. And there is no condemnation for all of those who believe in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is another manifestation of the true power. That is another manifestation of what a mighty God is revealed in Jesus' death and resurrection. But according to Paul, another great way of how God manifests his power as a mighty God is by empowering his son when he declared Jesus to be Son of God in power. Paul describes the cross as the power of God. You can find that in 1 Corinthians 1.18. And of course, um, this message is absolute foolishness to all of those who do not believe. But for those who do, friends, for all of those who claim to be believers, for all of those who claim to be in Jesus Christ, Christ is the power of God and is the wisdom of God, as we also looked lastly. Yet, as Paul says it, if we stopped here, only at the crucifixion, we'd be left with lopsided view of things. Paul says that if Christ did not raise from the dead, we would be the poorest of this world. Because all of the things that had happened, all that he had promised, would have meant absolutely nothing. 
So we need to press on, if you like, in the life of Jesus to his resurrection because that's where the whole power is. In the third day, God raised Jesus from the dead. And we see the power of the mighty God on display. A supreme power. Now consider um, what Paul tried to tell us in, in Romans from chapter 1, if you like. Um, he begins by um, rehearsing of who Jesus is. So he first tells us um, of his messianic inheritance or pedigree. He starts with his genealogical link to the line of David, Israel's greatest king. And he points to the life as his earthly life of Jesus. And then very smoothly, um, Paul continues um, to, to speak to G uh, about Jesus, how he is enthroned as a Messiah through his resurrection. From the dead. In verse 4 of chapter 1 in Romans, he said, He's appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. And there has never been any greater demonstration of power than what God raised Jesus from the dead and declared him to be the Son of God in power. That is an amazing truth, friends. But here is something that is mind-blowing. Something that you and I can take power and strength from, encouragement from. Paul teaches us that um, this power that raised Jesus from the dead, this power that was manifested in the resurrection of Jesus. This same power is now at work in all of us who believe. All of those who believe in the name of Jesus. All of those who profess Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. The same very power that raised Jesus from the dead. That was manifested at the resurrection of Jesus lives and works in us. I know that it is so hard to believe. And this is why Paul, when he was speaking to the Christians in, in Ephesus, um, he prays for them that they could get their heads and their hearts around to this breathtaking truth. Let me just read that passage, this powerful passage to you. It's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 to, to 20. Paul says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glory, inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly rail. Hallelujah. What a beautiful truth that is. And Paul, he says, with other words, I know how difficult it is, but I am praying constantly. I am not stopping and praying. Ever since I've heard that you have this amazing excitement and faith about God, that God would give you the wisdom, that he would open your minds and he would open your hearts to this breathtaking truth, to this power that is within us our hearts, that very same power that God exerted in raising Christ from the dead and that he has seated him in the, in the right hand in the heavenly reign. That same power 
The resurrection power is at work in you and is at work in me. If you are a believer, the same power that raised Jesus is now at work in you to do immeasurably more than all you can ask or think. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? But it is true. It is true what God is telling us. If you, you know, whoever is listening to this sermon, us as Christians in Brown Hill Road Baptist Church or others who may not um, know quite who Jesus is, we need to remember friends. We need to boost that energy that it is in us. That that power of God is in us to do immeasurably more than we can think or we can do. We need to be aware, indeed, that the same power that gave Jesus body, that lifeless corpse, if you like, gave him life, that same power is in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I find it very exciting. I find it very exciting to look at who Jesus is, to remind of what a privilege it is for us to profess that we belong to such amazing God. And I think this is the message that Isaiah wants to give to those people. All oh, what God has in store for you has never happened before. It will be, uh, it is amazing. And friends, we are privileged. We live in a time of a promise. We live in Jesus. We have heard, we have seen through Scripture that He came and He has gone. That, that revelation has already happened and we can live through faith. But let me tell you, let me tell you this. It doesn't stop there. It will continue. The prophecy, the plan that God has put in motion will unfold. And the time will come. Maybe you and I, our generation, will not see it. But our children or our children's children will. Because we do not know the timing. But God has made it clear that Jesus came, Jesus has gone to heaven. But there will be a time that he will be coming back again. And oh, what a glorious time that will be. Whenever that time will be, he will come back to claim all of those who believe in him. And I like the passage in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. And it says that the time will come when he will come again. And at that time, every knee will bow. It doesn't say some knees. It doesn't say some lives will humble themselves and will confess. It doesn't say just those who believe in Christ, but every knee. Whether you believe, whether you don't, the time will come where you will see the truth. You will see for who Jesus is. And everyone will confess he is the one. He is Jesus. That will be the lost days where Jesus will be here and taking us to heaven. We can gain strength from that. And I am privileged to have that truth, to know that the power of God dwells in me. And I can live not according to my might, but through the power of God. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and may this preaching encourage you in whatever situation you may go in through. God bless you for now. Bye.